Well, um, welcome everyone to yeah. episode 11. And today we are going to talk to you engineers from the Dart to JS team. And so stick around and you can learn how we get Dart code to run across modern browsers. I'm JJ Barrons. This is Seth Ladd. And Hello. First, the news. Yep. Uh, this all comes thanks to Chris Bucket's uh, Dart Watch blog. So thank, thank you for you collecting all the news. First off, Mike Eberhardt has created Dart Squid, his UI SVG components. Now, have you worked with SVG? Uh, no, actually, I haven't. You know, for some reason, I've never gotten a chance to do that. I think it's an underappreciated technology, and uh, I look forward to more deployments of SVG, and especially with Dart. So check out Mike's library. You know, the thing I don't like about SVG is, you know, I'm not a very attractive guy, and so what I like is, like, Taking a picture of myself as a GIF and then like blowing it up, I'm kind of fuzzy. But an SVG is like, you know, you it is see, vector graphics. Yeah, it's yes. like you can see everything. <laughs> There's no hiding behind the fuzz. Simon Pai from uh, the Dart Framework Builders Rukulo, and you can remember them from a previous episode, yep. Good episode, has blogged about a rotatable map prototype. So it's really cool to see uh, another UI framework built in Dart, and these guys are friends of the project, and it's fun to track their project. Florian Leutsch, one of the members of the Dart to JS team. We'll hear from him in a minute. Yes. Uh, we'll be speaking on JavaScript as a compilation target at JSConf EU. Now, this is really cool. It's a heavy JavaScript conference. Uh, but we're going to talk about how we get Dart to JavaScript there. Yeah, that turns out to be a lot more complex than I thought it would be. Yeah. And uh, with a pub, the package manager for Dart getting released uh, very soon. In fact, it's in the SDK today. Uh, the server components are coming online shortly. And you see more documentation posted about how to create a package, what does the versioning system look like, um, and how to declare your dependencies. Uh, in preparation of the Dart M1 language changes, now this is cool. The editor will help you quick fix or clean up your, it sounds weird, but legacy Dart code. That is the code before the M1 uh, line in the sand or the release, if you will. And so it'll help you update the syntax for things like your, uh, the catch, the try catch blocks, uh, moving from classes, uh, interfaces to classes and more. And so uh, definitely try this out. And as more implementations of the new language features come online, the, the new editor cleanups will get even more and more useful. Dude, this is freaking magical. You know, for a long time, I was super jealous over Go because Go had this nice thing where it could like automatically, you know, uh, upgrade your code to new APIs. But now we have it directly in the editor. I'm super psyched about this. Yeah, this is awesome. So check, try out that feature and let us know how it works. So John Evans, one of the early adopters of Dart and the author of the Buckshot UI framework, has been blogging about his experience using the Mirrors API. Now, Mirrors are awesome because it's our way to do reflection, things yeah. like tell me more about the class I'm operating with, and I think in the future, do things like construct a class on the fly. Yep. Finally, for our uh, more news, we have 83% uh, more awesome api.dartlang.org uh, site now with a find as you type search feature. Now, have you tried this? Um, uh, yeah, briefly, but I'm really wondering, how'd you come up with the 83%? Uh, it's very complicated. We had to use 6,000 cores and Compute Engine, wrote it all with Dart, uh, but it is verifiable. And it's really nice because we have a lot of classes and interfaces that use, for instance, the word element. And sometimes you want to just find the super class element. Mm -hmm. And so now you can go right up to the search box, type element, and it comes up in a nice ranking order. And so much easier now to browse around if you just want to know uh, what does our API provide. So definitely try that out. You know, it's funny. It, you know, everyone, if you're a language guy like I am, you kind of spend all your time thinking about the language. But actually, a lot of those other things actually really help out your productivity because, you know, spending a lot of time searching through docs instead of having something that immediately takes you, what you to what you want could really increase your productivity. So I'm excited about that. Yeah, yeah. Great. Well, that's what we have for the news. So now let's invite our wait, guests. What? Wait, hang on. I'm okay. going to do it. You ready? One, two, three. <laughs> Ta-da! <laughs> Hey, well, welcome to hey. the show, guys. Thanks. How was that? Thanks. Your first magical uh, teleportation? Oh, not Do the okay. first. No. no, not the first, right? Yeah. It's my no. first. It's more easier than I expected. <laughs> yeah. So can you say something cool in Danish? <laughs> I, I, I can't tell if that's cool or not. Ah, you earl a Well, yeah, that's, well, that's obvious. <laughs> We're going to get some good YouTube comments from that. <laughs> so most importantly, how do you pronounce Aarhus? Aarhus. Aarhus. 
That was pretty close. Yeah. Almost, yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. You guys want to introduce yourselves? Yes, I'm Florian Leutsch, and I'm yeah, I've been working with on Dart for since the beginning. I my background is basically Scheme and compilers. So I wrote a Scheme to JavaScript compiler, and then I wrote a JavaScript to Scheme compiler, and then <laughs> I joined the V8 team, and yeah. So and then eventually I transitioned to Dart, and now I'm working on a Dart to JavaScript compiler. So. Charles comes back to JavaScript. Start yes. dynamic languages scheme. That that's my awesome. Point. And I'm I'm Casper Lund. Uh, I worked on on Dart since the beginning too. Um, and now I'm working on Dart to JS, compiling Dart to efficient JavaScript code. Um, before that, I spent some years on on optimizing uh, JavaScript in Chrome and the V8 engine. So uh, I had a uh, a lot of work in, in in trying to make JavaScript run really quickly. So now now it's kind of nice to be able to to make good use of that uh, by uh, by compiling to it as a target language. Yeah, my name is Peter von der He, uh, and I work on uh, Dart to JS. Uh, I mostly uh, focus on the front end that is uh, parsing, uh, symbol resolution, and uh, stuff like that, uh, type checking, um, inferring types perhaps. And then uh, before uh, before joining uh, Google, I have worked on uh, Java, uh, Java C, the the compiler. Uh, and I have also worked on uh, Gilad Barker's uh, Newspeak project. Wow. And we should do a shout out to the rest of the Dart to JS team who we only have this big of a couch, but yeah. we have a really awesome team. We want to thank everyone uh, for all their work. And I should probably say we have an external contributor working on Dart to JS. Is that right? That is true. Yeah. It's our first external contributor. Good. Uh, after, after submitting a few uh, CLs on uh, his behalf, um, we asked him if he wanted to be a, a, a full-scale committer on the project. That's pretty amazing. That's nice. Yeah. More resources. That's, That's good. a good song. Yeah. <laughs> I also think that really points out, you know, uh, the open source nature of Dart. So I'm really interested in the design of the language and how it's been impacted by what has always been a core belief of ours that it has to compile to fast, sane, logical JavaScript. Can we talk a little bit about how that's impacted? Yeah, I mean, from the get-go, we uh, we knew that being able to run on on any browser was really important for Dart to be interesting for people that wanted to develop big, large web apps for the for the real world. Um, so we we looked at the uh, constraints imposed by uh, using JavaScript as a target language, and some of the things that we, we probably wanted to try out in the language were really hard to do when compiled to JavaScript. A few of them are things like non-local returns, where you can return from an inner function, uh, and you actually end up returning. Uh, not from the function itself, but, but from the enclosing functions instead, which is a really cool feature. Wow. It's just hard to implement in JavaScript efficiently because it ends up being something with throwing exceptions. Mm -hmm. So that's something we, we dropped and said, let's not do that for now. It's, uh, it's too complicated to make that efficient. Uh, so let's keep it uh, closer to what you can do in JavaScript. Mm -hmm. There are a few other things that we also decided not to <coughs> push too hard on. Um, and on, on the syntax front, we, we, uh, we try to stay reasonably true to, to JavaScript so it would look familiar, feel familiar to people. I think that's very important for, for adoption. Yeah, I think in general, when we had the choice, when we weren't sure, and there were several valid choices, we picked the one from JavaScript just to make it comfortable and to make it familiar to, to JavaScript developers. Mm -hmm. You could say that the, um, the, uh, the async uh, programming style that we use in Dart is also uh, inherited from, from JavaScript. We're not ruling out uh, allowing users to, to um, tell us to trust the type annotations if they really need that for deployment. It's just putting that in uh, too early will essentially remove all pressure from us to deliver something that's really, really nice without those kind of uh, slightly hacky optimization. Right? So we like to have that pressure put on us to deliver something that's really fast without unsafe optimizations. I think it's also a, a workflow issue. The way we envision Dart being deployed a lot is it's a very scalable language. So you can start with just some functions mm -hmm. and small prototype and you don't really have types in play here. Uh, and, and we want people to kind of start that way. And so we don't want people to necessarily type everything at the very beginning. Of course, you can if you'd like, but you should have that option to scale up to very typed systems starting from a very small uh, you know, R&D project, if you will. Definitely. Yep. Before we take the questions, I want to actually dive in a little bit to what happens in, in Dart to JS, for instance. So um, I think this is a, a good point for our, our viewers who might come from, say, a CoffeeScript background and who have this idea that, okay, I can compile it in you know, one language or um, uh, convert one language to another. But in Dart to JS, I think 
we have different semantics, and that that governs a non-straightforward way. I think it's not comes. a syntax transformation. That's what I'm trying to say. Thank it's, you. It's yeah. even a semantic transformation. Yeah. So can can you talk about that? And for instance, like what what happens when I compile and add uh, int a comma int b in, into JavaScript? So um, Peter was sort of saying that the biggest problem is is really that you cannot just compile a Dart plus to a JavaScript plus, and that's exactly right. Um, so for method calls like calling a uh, foo a bar on some objects it's it's sort of a pretty direct translation mm -hmm. we have some slightly more advanced ways of passing arguments which needs to be dealt with but other than that we're just using javascript function calls to implement dart function calls essentially mm -hmm. um, but on the uh, on the sort of the primitive values where we use javascript numbers and stuff it's a uh, it's a bit more complicated because in dart you can you can provide a user defined implementation of an operator like plus mm -hmm. and it needs to work in the in the right way Whereas in JavaScript, there is really no way of defining a user-defined plus operator. You can just use the one that's built in, and if your objects have the right value of method, uh, they might participate in this kind of built-in plus operation. So Dart is more flexible there than JavaScript, um, but it also means that there is sort of a semantic gap between Dart plus and JavaScript plus. Um, in itself, it's pretty easy to implement <coughs> Dart plus. It's just very slow if you compile it to JavaScript and just essentially turn a plus into a method call. Mm -hmm. So we, we go through, I would say, great lengths to, um, yes. to try to, uh, um, to figure out when it's safe to compile a Dart plus into a JavaScript plus. And it's only safe under certain assumptions. It's only safe when you know you're operating on JavaScript numbers. Otherwise, you're not getting the right semantics. For instance, if you end up operating on JavaScript strings instead, uh, you'll get string concatenation out of it because that's what JavaScript does for plus, and that's not the, the Dart way. So we are we are sort of that's one of the, the sort of big challenges we have is just pushing enough type information around the system to to know when we can safely translate a plus to a plus. And then we also have uh, speculative optimizations. So in particular for for arrays, array accesses, we don't want to go through helper methods to do that. Um, so what we do is if we see that this might be a loop that that works with um, arrays. We do the check if it's a JavaScript array before the loop. We check if the index is, a, is an integer. And usually, the index is just incremented in the loop. So once we know it's an integer, it will stay an integer. So we do that before the loop. And in the loop, we have a nice, efficient access. And in case it's not an array or it's not an integer, we have a payload method. So we jump to another method. And there we do these slow accesses where we go through helper methods to make sure that if the left and if the array is actually, if the, the indexed object is actually not an array, then we go through the methods of it and, and make sure that everything works as expected. Mm. Uh, and again, that's, that's because um, um, indexing into uh, lists and collections in Dart is a user-definable operator. So uh, you can write your own collection type that allows you to index into it. That's not possible in something like JavaScript either. So we have to make use of the JavaScript like, primitive indexing operation when we can, when we know it's safe, or when we can generate essentially two code paths where it's safe in one and, and uh, maybe um, mm. uh, and, and faster, or we just do this bailout version that will do the right thing but be slower. So if you ever look at the generated JavaScript uh, output from the Dart to JS compiler and find these slightly weird bailout methods, that's the reason. It's because we're doing speculative optimiza optimizations where we, we're not guaranteed uh, at compile time that this will hold, so we have to generate two versions essentially. But one thing that many people probably don't know is that at least on certain JavaScript VMs, at least the ones I'm intimately familiar with, which is mostly V8, but um, there's actually a cost associated with passing the wrong number of arguments. Oh, yeah. Passing too few is costly, passing too many is costly too. It's not cost in the sense that your program will be super, super slow if, uh, if you get it wrong, um, but just to make the, uh, the essentially the sequence of instructions you have to execute to call something and return efficient in the common case, it, it's heavily optimized for the case where you pass exactly the right number of arguments. Mm -hmm. So there's uh, there's a good reason to do that um, if you care about performance, yep. especially for the uh, the hot uh, loops in your in your code. So um, great. Uh, will Dart to JS be able to output output compressed minified JavaScript like the Google Closure compiler in advanced mode? If it can compress properties, it also has to create a property mapping text file that could be used in web service JavaScript serializers. Well, we get the first half of this question a lot, mm -hmm. don't we, Seth? We do. 
And uh, you could just see a patch that landed very recently, dash dash minify. Tell us what happens when you use that new uh, command line argument. So I can take uh, responsibility for the command line argument, <laughs> and Florian can take responsibility for what happens when you use it. Um, so <laughs> the, the minify option is, uh, is, is the answer to this question, essentially. Yes, we will be providing a way of uh, outputting a minified, compressed uh, JavaScript output, uh, and uh, we will make uh, good use of the fact that we understand the program structure, and we'll use that to uh, generate really compact uh, output. You can tell people what happens if you use it. So currently, when when you use uh, dash dash minify, the only thing that happens is that uh, there are going to all unnecessary white space in in the produced methods is going to be removed. Right. So it's 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 not a much, but in our benchmarks, we we were able to get down by fifteen percent maybe. Yeah, and that's just by removing all the white space. Um, in future versions, yes, we want to have a, have a nice minifier, and and for us, it's definitely easier than for a tool that runs after the, the after. Um, on, on our generated code. So we will definitely have something that will minify the names and uh, the, the properties and, and class names and everything. Um, and when we do that, we will provide a mapping text file. That's just, I mean, that shouldn't be difficult and, and there's no reason not to do it. Yep. In fact, t today we're spitting out a, a source map file. It, we're not complete with that feature yet, but it is going to be part of this compilation and build step and that allow you to take uh, minified or un in unminified uh, JavaScript output and through the dev tools of Chrome, map it back to the original Dart code. And it's a really cool development workflow. Mm -hmm. So this question isn't about Dart to JS, but it seems to be really popular. Is there a public roadmap as to when we could expect Dart to be ready for serious deployment? I'm thinking about trying out larger projects and risky, riskily future-proofing them with Dart. I don't think we have a public roadmap for, for, for when we're ready for that. Right now, we're very much focused on delivering this uh, first milestone release uh, uh, where we'll get all these uh, new language features implemented across the board so you can start uh, relying on them uh, uh, in the editor, in Dart2JS, and on the VM. So you can really start making use of these new things. Yeah, it's uh, definitely been my experience that Dart is already a really, really good tool for building uh, web stuff and is a really productive p tool, but you have to understand that you have to move with the times. We're not trying to be backwards in uh, backwards compatible for you know ever since last October. We're always we're moving forward, and as long as you're willing to move forward with us, then I think Dart's a really productive tool. And I should say that Dart is an open source project. You can follow along on our mailing list. You can follow along on Bug Tracker. We publish uh, updates from the team, and so. I would say certainly give it a shot now, and if there's something specific you're looking for, let us know on the mailing list. And if you're look, considering it for a big project, we would love to know what you're what you're doing, and what your priorities are. So, as a web language, Dart needs to interact with existing web applications which use JavaScript. How does the Dart 2 JS compiler enable interaction with legacy JavaScript code like jQuery? This is another popular question. It's actually a very good question. So it's 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 actually a very difficult question uh, because. Um, Whatever we do, we, we want to make sure that you have the same experience when running Dart2JS and running on the on the Dart VM, so that code you write today will also run tomorrow. Um, so uh, right now, the the JavaScript interrupt that we have is uh, is is fairly difficult to use. Uh, we have some examples on how you can you can build uh, simple things that interact with, uh, for instance, Google Maps and and things like that. Uh, but it's 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 somewhat painful, and we're we're spending some time on trying to figure out if we can make it easier to use in a way that still works both on, on the, the Dartium, uh, Dart VM enabled uh, Chromium builds and on Dart2JS. So we, we should talk about one of the things that makes this a really tough problem for us, which is uh, now that you have multiple runtimes in the browser, you run into what we call a distributed GC uh, situation. Garbage collection, garbage yeah, collection. distributed garbage collection problems. Mm -hmm. That's a challenge. It's a big challenge, right? So you have uh, essentially have um, at least three different uh, uh, memory management systems in in, uh, in the game. Uh, you have the uh, the system that governs all the DOM nodes in your web page. You have uh, the JavaScript uh, memory manager, and you have the Dart memory manager. And they need to coordinate things. Um, and it, that may sound pretty easy, but in in reality, you want the, the garbage collectors in those systems to be really really efficient, incremental and uh, give you essentially no pause times and just great throughput. Uh, so combining that with a system that uh, tracks references between them is just very, very difficult. Um, so it, it's something that we're, um, we're trying to wrap our heads around uh, how to, to approach and how to solve, uh, but it's certainly not an easy, 
easy task to uh, to get through that. Can the work on type propagation improve the code size and speed even more in the future? We still see pretty huge chunks of bailout code and type agnostic code generated, which seems not necessary in many cases. So oh, that's, we kind of touched an, on this. That, that's an easy one. That's that's yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, we, have, we have only uh, we have only scratched the surface. I I, I think. Uh, yeah. So over the last uh, month or two, we've actually seen a lot of progress there, and um, I think this question sort of refers to the fact that. It is improving a lot, but we still, in certain cases, see a lot of things that could be get even better, and uh, that's nice for us because uh, that that will keep us busy for a, for a while. But it's certainly something we focus a lot on, uh, like getting a very good performance out of uh, of the generated JavaScript code um, through type propagations, type inferencing, mm -hmm. uh, and there's a lot of work going on in, in that in that area. Yeah. So the current status is basically, I mean, we have been already very good at, in local type inference, so. If there's a variable and we know the type, then we propagate this type and and, and use it even for speculative optimizations mm -hmm. and, and things like that. And recently, we started to use um, um, types on arguments and return values and sometimes on um, fields if they have been initialized only in specific locations or, or not too often and we can track it. But there is work on, on a global type inference tool that will help <coughs> to, to get much, much more type information and the moment we have type information, we produce better code. So what features of the Miras API do you think will make it into Dart to JS sooner than later? Introspection. Introspection. So that's basically uh, looking at the program structure, right? But not modifying it. Yeah, I know that this is, uh, I've heard a lot of people ask for this sort of thing because, you know, uh, frameworks like AngularJS rely on reflection as like a core feature of how they work. And so I know that a lot of people were interested in seeing reflection yeah. in Dart as yeah. well. So, um, yeah, uh, so um, my, my take on that is that, uh, yeah, you can write a lot of frameworks like that and uh, you're, you're probably going to, end up uh, feeling really uh, clever when you get it to work. Uh, but it's probably also frustrating when it's not working for you because there's a whole bunch of things going on, right? First you have, well, in AngularJS, I don't know if they have a, that's really a JavaScript framework, right? It's, it's, not, it's not a language. So there's no compile time step there, right? So that's, but we, we already have a compile time step. So we should sort of take advantage of that and, and then check your program there and then generate some yeah. efficient code. Right? Check for so, static warnings. Yeah, yeah. yeah well, well, but so there's, there's we, we have a compile time step, so mm -hmm. we should take advantage of that and, 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 and use that. Mm -hmm. um, but, but there's also, uh, for us to uh, put in all the information that is required to do introspection or modifying the program, then we also have to follow those conventions so, so that when we extend the program, the code we have already generated has to be compatible with how it's extended. So all of a sudden reflection uh, can have an impact on how we generate code. So the first cut, it's probably, uh, that, that's why we have designed the mirror system as it is. It's basically, um, it's a capability that you request. In this case, it would be by importing a library. You import this library, that may have to change how we generate code. Hmm. So just to give some examples of what changes would be needed. Um, if we mangle the, the field names or if we mangle class names, well, then we would need to ship some information to be able to get back from the mangled name to the original name. Similarly, if you're actually allowed to change, if you add new codes to your in, in, in with reflection, we cannot tree shake anymore because you might call a method that wasn't called before. A request for feedback from anybody watching this that's interested in introspection. And we, we love to get use cases on what kind of things you would like to see there and what kind of which parts of the introspection APIs are you using and and, um, and then we can we can start thinking about whether or not it's realistic to to get that rolled into Dart to JS in the not too distant future. Great. So will it be possible to write a new library in Dart that could be used either by Dart or plain JavaScript? So it's certainly something we would like to see happen. Uh, um, for us, uh, we think that it's it's uh, in uh, at least for certain things, components you want to write, it's more efficient to write them in, in Dart than it is in JavaScript. So if we could allow you to do that for certain components in your big project and just use them from, from other JavaScript things, it would be kind of neat. Um, it's something we're looking to uh, doing for the web components work we're doing. Uh, it would be very, very cool if you could take a web component that has behavior written in Dart 
compile it to JavaScript and use it from any web page. Right. Uh, it's certainly something we'd like to see. So it's a great question, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to answer it with a yes, let's do it uh, very soon. Uh, and then last one, um, if Gwit can compile JavaScript to run on Android browsers, then why can't Dart? I think I've been hearing some complaints that uh, uh, the JavaScript um, doesn't work on the Android browser. Um, committed today. Yeah, committed. Uh, I just committed a, a fix for, for the obvious syntax problem. Um, I'm expecting to hear for, I'm expecting to hear other bugs that, 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 that show me other maybe different problems, but um, so it should work, I mean, at least the syntax that was um, really making it impossible to run on Android browsers is, 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 has been fixed. Um, and actually that's another place where we got a nice patch from an external contributor. Mm -hmm. That was kind of nice. Yes. So I would also say if you could run uh, Chrome for your um, phone, it's, it's a nice experience. But, but to actually answer the, the, the question, um, why can't Quit compile and, and why can't we? Because they spent a huge amount of resources doing it. It's always a matter of prioritization. So it's great when we get feedback from people that say, I would really use this if it worked on Android browsers. It's something we can use. Mm -hmm. uh, and we can think about whether or not it makes sense to, to uh, put in the extra effort for, to, to make it run. When I compile my Dart code to JavaScript using Dart to JS, it doesn't really work in links. Uh, my text-based browser. Um, I don't think you've tried it. It actually works just fine. Does it, really? No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so uh, thank you guys for all your time today. Um, it's been a great show. Um, and I think we will see you guys back when Seth and I return to California, and we'll do our next episode in two weeks. Absolutely, and thanks for watching Dartisans. You can find the Dart project at dartlang.org. Uh, do join our mailing list at dartlang.org slash mailing dash list and we have bug tracker at dartbug.com lots of good ways to get in touch with us and uh, we're always looking for feedback i mean we, yep. we've certainly prioritized things based on what we hear we've taken external patches it's a really cool open source project and so please do let us know what you're using dart for and what you need to do okay goodbye from ohus ohus bye